operating under the assumption that most of you recognize those familiar strains, the theme song to Leave It to Beaver. It also occurs to me as we watch that little clip, uh, the Beaver shows air in large part on TBS now, on Ted Turner's broadcasting system. He's got the rights to them. He wouldn't dare colorize them, would he? In any case, Jerry Mathers, the Beaver, is our guest tonight. We're going to get the lowdown on his character, on Warden June, on Wally and Eddie Haskell and the whole gang tonight with Jerry Mathers. It's been almost exactly 25 years since Leave it to Beaver was canceled, finally. It had begun in 1957 and went into early 1963, replaced, interestingly enough, immediately by Fred McMurray and my three sons. But a quarter century later, there really hasn't been much time, if any, when Jerry Mathers and his friends, Eddie Haskell and company, have been off the air. You can see him somewhere in syndication almost constantly. Jerry, good to have you on the program. And, and I, won about. I wonder if you've given much thought to why this program, which was popular in its first run, but why it's had this kind of staying power and has become such a classic. Because there were other programs as popular or more popular right. at the time that they, they were on the air in first run. Well, I think the writing was so well done. And when the show was on first run, they really missed uh, a lot of the audience. They thought that Leave it to Beaver was an adult show. And because of that, it was on like Thursday nights at 9 o'clock or 9.30. Well, all the kids had already gone to bed. As soon as it went off the air and went into syndication, suddenly they picked up a vast audience of people from the age of, say, 5 to maybe 16 or 17. And it became very, very popular with all those people. And so it picked up the audience that it had and a lot of kids. What's the audience for Leave it to Beaver now, though? I'm not talking about the new Still the Beaver mm -hmm. program. I'm talking about the reruns. Is the audience kids who've never seen it before, or is the audience people my age who remember it? Well, the best way for me to judge it is I, I like people, and I do a lot of personal appearances. I'll go to shopping centers or just all sorts of different things, college campuses. And when I go to a shopping center, they'll say, well, what kind of people can we expect? What are the demographics of the show? And it's very, very strange because I get everything from kids that are five and six years old that are just watching the reruns for the very first time, people in high school, people that are young parents that say, I watched the show with my parents and now I'm watching it with my children because it's something that I can sit down and relate to and my kids like it or they can watch it by themselves and grandparents that watched it first run yeah. with their kids. So it has a very, very wide demographic range. You were eight years old when you started on the program. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you ever wonder why your own family wasn't more like the Cleaver family when you went home? N not really. Uh, even though it was a wonderful family, I was very happy with my family. You know, I had the problems that, that everybody has. I mean, every kid wants to stay up a little later and watch an extra TV show or do this or do that. So, I mean, it wasn't like my family was just so special that they were as good as the Cleavers because I don't think there was a family like that anywhere. They were the ideal family. But I knew that that was reality. I'd been an actor for quite a while, even when I started Leave it to Beaver, and I knew that what was on the screen was not what was really happening in the world. In fact, that's probably the biggest complaint that we get about Leave it to Beaver, is people say, you know, my home wasn't like that, and I say, neither was mine. Did you relate to Hugh Beaumont as a father figure in any way? No, and he was a, a very nice person, and I worked with him every day, but... He had two kids. I, I knew, actually three kids, and I knew them all. And Barbara Billingsley had two sons, about the age of Wally and the Beaver. So uh, I didn't feel like Tony Dow was my real brother. They're all my very best friends. But I knew that I'd go home to my parents, and they would go home and be parents. What kind of a guy, really, was Ken Osmond, Eddie Haskell, then and now? I mean, I think all of us would kind of like to believe that he was a jerk. And see, that's probably the, the, the worst thing you could say about him, because he's the nicest guy in the world. You ruined my night. Well, let me tell you about him. He's the type of guy that uh, after he got out of school, he became a carpenter for a while. He had his own helicopter service. Uh, and then he decided that he wasn't doing enough for the community, so he joined the Los Angeles Police Department. Stop, stop. <laughs> then he decided that the L.A. Police Department needed people to go down and work on motorcycles, uh, basically in our ghetto. And he was, he worked the uh, DWI, which is driving under the influence. So he was working from 10 at night to like 3 and 4 in the morning, pulling over drunks. And you can imagine that's not the most pleasant work. Mm -hmm. He happened to be chasing a, uh, a taxi cab that he thought was driving rather erratically, chased it into a dead-end alley. And it turns out that the taxi cab was stolen. Guy pulled a gun and shot him three times. Luckily, he had a flak vest on. But it, uh, it disabled him enough that he couldn't be a motorcycle policeman anymore. And... 
basically would probably be stuck in a, in a desk job for the rest of his police career. And that's how we're lucky enough to have him on the show. If it wasn't for that, he put in 14 years with the police department. I'm sure he'd still be there. The near tragedy you mentioned brings to mind the rumored tragedy concerning Jerry Mathers. Now, you did spend time in the mid to late 60s in the Air National Guard. That's and right. that was Six during years. the height of combat in Vietnam. A rumor that was more than a rumor. Oh, yes. Many of us believed that it was true. Jerry Mathers killed in Vietnam. It went out on both wire services, Bob. And what they tell me at that time is that uh, bureau chiefs for the uh, UPI and AP would, would scan casualty lists in major cities looking for people of some prominence in their particular city. And somebody saw either the same name or a very similar name and just said, oh, and I'd done the uh, Academy Awards that year. I'd given out an award to Gene Kelly, and I'd done that in uniform. So people said, oh, it must be him. I saw him on the awards, and he's yeah. dead, and they ran the story. And then Shelley Winters went on The Tonight Show that night, and having read it in the paper, said, you know, it's such a tragedy. We're losing, uh, you know, our youth in, in Vietnam. And, of course, everybody thinks that uh, all actors know each other. If there's anything funny about it, this would this would probably be it. People that were not real fans, but were personal friends of mine, but maybe people like you went to high school with mm -hmm. that you hadn't seen in, say, three or four years because I was in the service, they'd see me walking down the street, and they'd get a real funny look on their face, and they'd say, uh, I read something about you, and I'd say, oh, yeah, what was that? And they'd say, well, you're not dead, are you? I'd say, no. So, uh, you know, that was... It didn't you have a publicist or somebody who could just get out there and put the story to rest? No, actually, at that time, I really wasn't in the industry. I was in the service and uh, just being what you know, a regular serviceman. I didn't have a publicist. I didn't have an agent. Uh, you know, I was I was in the Air Force or the Air National Guard. ago. What were your feelings? Did you remain close to him? Was there a special feeling at that time? There really was, and it, it was, the, in the way he died, it, it was kind of, uh, it, it didn't hit me as hard for quite a while. I'll tell you why. He had been a, a Methodist minister and actually had become an actor and a radio announcer because he was in a very poor parish. They couldn't support a minister. He'd just gotten married. Uh, he had his first, I guess it was son on the way. And so he needed a part-time job. He became an actor. So that's the kind of person he was. When he died, uh, he'd been sick for quite a while. He'd had a heart attack and a stroke. And he was fairly much laid up for the last, oh, seven to eight months of his life. And his son was over in Germany, and he was working with the Army as a psychologist. And he hadn't seen his grandkids in quite a while. So he went over there and uh, just got up out of his hospital bed, went over there, visited with them for about three weeks, and died. Uh, he had his body cremated, and he used to grow Christmas trees in Minnesota that he'd bring out to California and sell at Christmas time. And he had his remains scattered on that island. So there wasn't uh, a huge funeral or really any time to, uh, for all the people that had known him to get together and to disperse all our grief. And when we did the, the new Leave it to Beaver, when we did Still the Beaver, the movie, we had a scene where we were all at the cemetery. And it was raining, and we were all standing there, and it said uh, Ward Cleaver, but it was the first time that we'd really all been together. Barbara Billingsley, Tony Dow, Ken Osmond, and a lot of other people from the original cast. Yeah. And that's when it, it really hit home. As I say before, it was, it was just a, a phone call. In fact, one of the major newspapers called me up and said, the embassy reports that, you know, a person, uh, you know, has died. Uh, Hugh Beaumont, is it true? I said, well, I don't know. And I called some people, and it was the kind of thing. It just didn't really hit till then. So it, that was probably almost six to eight months later that it really hit. And then when we started doing the new show, it, it really hit. It, it's like a, a cog in the wheel, and every time... We hit that particular point in the wheel. It squeaks a little bit. He's really missed. The new show's been on a while, and uh, we're in our fourth season. Additional programs in production. Are you happy with it, or do you feel, as I do, honestly, that no matter how well you do it, the circumstances, the feeling just cannot be recreated, and so it cannot strike the same true note that the other did? Well, it's the type of thing that you can never go back again. 
but we're not going back, we're going on. This is Mayfield in the 80s, just like Leave it to Beaver was Mayfield in the 50s and the 60s. And I think if you were to look back at your childhood, uh, and, and if you look at children nowadays, you'd say that they have different problems and different things going on. So it is a different world. And we're, as Leave, in the original Leave it to Beaver, we dealt with alcoholism, we dealt with divorce, we dealt with a lot of things that were very controversial for a situation comedy of the time. With the new Leave it to Beaver, we're tackling some of those same areas, but we're also tackling relationships, and that's what made the original show so good. The relationships between parents mm -hmm. and children, and between children and, and their, and their uh, you know, uh, peers. See, very honestly, I don't remember the original show tackling controversial issues. It was always more along the lines of Beaver is named the fire chief of the class, and he gets obsessed with it and goes around giving everybody in the neighborhood a citation, and, okay. and June is upset, and, and that's the entire topic of conversation around the house is that one particular isolated non-controversial childhood problem and i don't say that critically i think okay. that was the wonderful charm of the show well we had a show where beaver had a friend that came over chopper to spend the weekend chopper came in and he had all these presents he had baseball gloves he was going to get a pony because he had i think three mothers and three or four fathers or stepfathers and beaver said how do you get all that stuff he says well every time my parents have an argument they get divorced yeah. beaver goes into warden june and says why don't you get divorced so at Christmas and my birthday I can get all those presents and Ward takes Beaver into the den and his infinite wisdom says do you want to break up our happy family you probably don't remember that one because no. it was interwound with the show and you just kind of sat there but that if you really analyze it is the message of that particular show Ward hires an alcoholic painter to, to rehabilitate him he starts to paint the house he asks Beaver if he can have a drink Beaver says would you like some lemonade the guy says I'd like something a little stronger Beaver says well Aunt Martha left some stuff in the cabinet would you like some of that comes home and, the, and he's drunk and, and Ward has to explain to Beaver that some people can't drink. So there were shows like that. Which were your favorite episodes? You mentioned Aunt Martha. I like the one where Aunt Martha visited and, and wanted you to wear the, the silly prissy outfit. The Eaton suit. Yeah, yeah and uh, the short pants and the long socks and, and Ward waited in the garage and got you out of it in a way that was that was very graceful. He didn't hurt Aunt Martha's feelings, but, but he needed jeans, he, jeans to wear. He <laughs> gave you jeans to wear to school so that Whitey and Gilbert and Richard wouldn't rank you out. Um, you know, it's very hard for me to pick a favorite show, and it's not that I don't like many of them, but it's when I watch one and then I say, gee, that's my favorite, uh, yeah. I'll watch another one, I'll say, but that one's awfully good. One of my favorites is when I fell in the soup bowl. Uh, yeah, that one, I just, I particularly like it. Up on a billboard, right? Up on a billboard, crawled up in a billboard to see if there was really soup in it. And I think that's one of my favorites, mm -hmm. but for me, it's almost like watching home movies. When I see a show, I say to myself, gee, I remember who the director was. I remember the cameramen, the sound people, the lighting technicians. And things always happened. Whenever we were out, we'd go up to uh, Miller's Pond. Well, at lunchtime, we'd cut down a, a sapling. We'd get a string. And they had, uh, I guess they're a little perch and bluegills in, this, in that string to eat up the mosquitoes. And it's on the back lot of Universal. But we could get, like, bologna and bread and fish out there. So I'll see a show, and everybody will be saying, gee, that's an interesting show. I'll say, gee, I remember I caught a bluegill that day. So it brings back other memories for me. So some of the ones that maybe aren't as, as being remembered by other people to me have very special values. We'll be back right after this. Tell me about when you auditioned for the part. Uh, you were eight years old, and I'm told that the producers were uh, taken by the fact that all these other child actor types were more professional, and you were more like the kid. Well, that, that's probably true. I, uh, my parents had always made it very, very easy for me to work because it was never anything that was forced on me. It was always, if you want to work, fine. And it was just so interesting at the studios. It was something that I just loved to do, was to go to the studio and meet all the people and make films. So when the, the actual interview came up for Leave to Be, there was about 6,000 people on the interview because they wanted boys between the ages of 6 and 18. What we did is go in and I'd read with one boy and they, he maybe wasn't as good and they'd say, okay, come back the next day. So after doing this for about a week, I was very, very tired. I mean, it was the kind of thing, it wasn't fun anymore. Interviews weren't fun. Going and working before the cameras was fun. So I was in there, I was, I, my mom had said, I was supposed to have a Cub Scout meeting that day. My mom said, no, you can't do it because you gotta go to an interview. I said, well, okay, I'll go. But I was fidgety, I, and I said, my mom said, if we get back in time, we probably will, you can mm -hmm. go to the meeting. So I put on my uniform and went to the interview. 
you. Well, I'm there, I'm fidgeting and going, ah, you know, I want to get out of there. And they noticed that, and they said, what's wrong? I said, well, you know, I've been here for like six or seven days, I want to go to my Cub Scout meeting. And they said, okay, bye, go ahead. And my mom said, you know, you've come all this way, you got to the very last, there's only like six or seven people left out of 6,000, and now you told them you're not interested. Well, they called back that night and said that I got the job because they that wanted a kid that wasn't that interested. Made you perfect. Did you hang around with other child TV stars? I mean, were you palling around with Jane North, Dennis the Menace, or Rusty Hamer and Angela Cartwright from Danny Thomas? I knew them, but I didn't pal around with them. Not that they weren't, you know, good people. It's just that we were all at different studios. Um, the people that were at the Universal lot, I knew, but there really weren't any other... As I, um, Bachelor Father with Noreen Corcoran was yeah. the only other show on the lot with a child even in it, and I think she was like 16 when I was eight, so I didn't have a chance. Boy, John Forsyth has some staying power, doesn't he? Oh, for sure. Yeah. You mentioned the Universal lot. You had worked earlier before becoming the Beaver uh, in a few motion pictures, one of which was The Trouble with Harry. Actually, that was one of John Forsyth's very first movies. And, and, and Shirley MacLaine's first. You, you were Shirley MacLaine's son right. in the movie, and The Trouble mm -hmm. with Harry was that Harry was dead. Was very and, dead. And Hitchcock directed it. That's right. So now, here's Hitchcock on the Universal lot doing the Alfred Hitchcock TV series, and you're over there doing Beaver, and your paths crossed again, right? Uh, actually, he just totally blew me away. I wish now that I, I realized the magnitude of the man because he was just so nice to me. I went back to Vermont and spent about two and a half months filming The Trouble with Harry. So, I mean, we became not close friends, but I knew him and he knew me. When I was doing Leave to Beaver, he'd come in with his Rolls Royce and he'd come in and just do the uh, the segues for uh, Alfred Hitchcock Theater. And the chauffeur would open the door and I'd be running around playing baseball or whatever and he'd get out of the car and he'd go, Oh, hello, Mr. Mathers. Good and day, just, Mr. Mathers. That was it. Blew me away because no one ever called me Mr. Mathers. I was either the beaver or Jerry. And I said, gee, here's this guy that calls me Mr. Mathers. Wow. So, I mean, he was just a truly great man. Do you ever tire of the fact that, and I'm sure it happened walking in and soon out of this building, it happens everywhere, that people come up and they treat you as if you were, are, the beaver? No, because the character is, is something that I, I really approve of. It's basically the all-American boy or the all-American man. and It's something that I really like. Anytime anybody sees me, if they can't remember Jerry, they say, hi, Beaver. And to me, that's only a compliment. I have so many friends that are actors that would love anybody to come up and ask for their autograph that when somebody comes up and asks for mine, as I say, it's just it's part of the game, and I just love it. It's something I really like. It's almost time for you to go, and okay. when you're leaving the house, yeah, this is always the case, you have to take your lunch pail hop with you, so Cassidy here's the too. Hop Along Cassidy lunch pail, uh, and of course the, the thermos. There's no sandwich, Bob. I mean, I'm going to get awful hungry on the boat to Blue Hotel. going to get a peanut butter and jelly oh, sandwich in here. The crew is working on that, but we do have, do have the thermos into which you could put the, the cocoa marsh or, right. or whatever. So milk. That would work out perfectly. And some cookies. Don't forget, June will put those cookies in. If you don't give them to me, I won't feel at home. That's great to see you. This was a genuine thrill. My pleasure. Thank you. Jerry Mathers, we're coming right back. You know, we all have our health. Look at Mom. She's a whirlwind. Checkmate. <laughs> Why did I ever teach you this game? Hey, what are you complaining about? Yeah. You know, you're right. What am I complaining about? My thanks to Jerry Mathers for leaving me with this actual Mayfield High letter sweater with my name on it. Next time, I've got to ask him about that occasion when Beaver ran Ward's phone bill up by calling Don Drysdale on the Dodger Clubhouse. A classic episode. Until then, see you later. Join Bob Monday night when his guest will be Jimmy J.J. Walker.